the internal contradictions of Marxism, the labor theory of value. So this is one of the reasons why Marx's economic slash philosophical worldview is self-defeating. It, it does not meet the standard of its own claims. And I'm going to demonstrate that. And this argument is not original to me. It comes from an economic writer named Eugene um, Bavark, who's a German economist who debunked the labor theory of value over a hundred years ago. That being said, and he wrote the book, Marx and the Close of His System, but he showed that Marx's system by its own standards does not meet its own claims. That being said, it's a little bit dense and it's a little bit confusing. And even articles on this topic, reading, listening to lectures, trying to understand it, took me a while to figure this out. But really it comes down to this idea, this foundational idea for Marxism of the labor theory of value, which is also not unique to Marxism. The labor theory of value is the whole economic and philosophical, philosophical worldview of Marx is founded on this idea of what is called the labor theory of value. And not only by Marxism, but also by free market economists like Adam Smith and his famous Wealth of Nations and David Ricardo, which I believe he wrote a book called Principles of Economics or a paper in the 18, early 1800s called Principles of Economics, which is considered a free market kind of perspective. So the labor theory of value is not just associated with Marxism and communism. It is associated with free market economists as well. But Karl Marx is associated with this area of thought because Karl Marx, to his credit, actually went a little bit further, whereas the previous economists just assumed the labor theory of value to be true. Marx actually tried to explain it and empirically demonstrate and justify the labor theory of value. He actually tried to work it out. And so that's why it's associated with him. And because rather than just assuming it, he made it the, the core foundation of his whole system. Now let's define what the labor theory of value is. According to pretty useful online encyclopedia of economics on Marxism. It has a section on the labor theory of value, defines the labor theory, the labor theory of value, defines value um, this way. It's, it's, it's quote, the theory's basic claim is simple. The value of a commodity can be objectively measured by the average number of labor hours required to produce that commodity. Okay, so basically, the simple idea uh, that's at the core of the labor theory of value, although the building of it gets a little bit more complex than this, is that <clears throat> commodities have value, whether they're goods, services like cell phones, shoes, bread, haircut, you know, whatever they may be, that the core thing that gives those things objective, measurable value is the human labor that contributed to them. And even the parts that went into uh, creating those things, for example, like a haircut, the labor that went into the scissors comes out into the value of the haircut. Okay, so it, Marx worked this back to human labor. So did other economists as well. So that they believed that value economically could be objectively measurable that it could be quantified and not just subjective, meaning based on what the consumers want. So, but Marx gave some caveats here and some conditions of labor. Not all labor is the same. The example I give to students is I, he did not believe this kind of idea of if I just took out a sledgehammer and went out and hit the ground with a sledgehammer for eight hours and I say, okay, where's my money? Because I just did a bunch of labor. That doesn't count. 
that's not the type of labor that he's talking about. It's not just that it has labor. Um, it's the idea of socially useful human labor. Now, as an economist, that is a point at which I could say, well, wait a second, socially useful is a term of value judgment. Economics is supposed to be a value-free science of empirical uh, information that says what is and how human beings behave. It doesn't give value judgments like socially useful. How do you quantify and operationalize and define those things that because what is socially useful could be subjective? However, even if we say, okay, let's let Marx have that one, socially useful human labor, we get that, that your labor has to, that the human labor involved in producing something like a haircut has to have some sort of use in society. It has to be useful to, uh, as deemed useful by other human beings. Okay, so we're going to let that slide that that seems to be human beings placing value on something rather than something having value because of labor. But we'll, we'll take Marx on his own terms. Socially useful human labor. So a haircut provides a service that is socially useful. Mowing a lawn provides a service that is socially useful. Baking a loaf of bread provides a service that is socially useful. People have utility when they eat the bread. Or when somebody buys a shirt, that's, that's a socially useful good that has been produced according to Marx by human labor and that that's where the value comes from. So believe that you could measure the objective value of commodities that not all, but he also believed that not all human labor is the same, that human labor is different. So it's not based on if you're lazy or you're slow or not very good at something or unskilled that your labor is, uh, is equally as valuable. What, what the labor theory of value states is that value comes from the average of the human labor used to produce it, that that's where the value comes from. But he also acknowledged that not all labor is the same. That being said, all labor is a multiple of other labor. So for example, someone digging a ditch and a doctor performing brain surgery are not the same. Marx recognized that, but his argument was that the doctor performing the surgery, if you divide that by a certain number, you will get a number that is equal to the worker digging the ditch. Or if you take the worker digging the ditch and you multiply it by X, whatever number X happens to be, you will get to the same amount of labor value as the surgeon performing surgery. So the idea would kind of work like this. If someone takes two, on average in a society, socially useful human labor, takes two hours on average to make shoes, and someone else takes two hours to bake a loaf of bread, I'm sorry, it takes one hour to bake a loaf of bread. Then the assumption is the shoes are twice as valuable as the loaf of bread, objectively. Okay, so this is how it kind of works. And now labor has to create what Marx called use value or utility. So by definition, labor is not valuable unless it has this aspect of use value or utility. Otherwise you could argue about going out and just making mud pies or hitting the ground with a sledgehammer over and over and over again. Those things aren't valuable because they have no utility. They have no use value. So that's going to be important to understand in the definition later. Now Marx kind of thought through this. He goes, how is socially necessary labor time defined? He thinks through, okay, what, what does it mean by socially necessary or social value labor, okay? Or use or value or utility. These are all terms kind of referring to the same concept. Now he said, quote, in his book, 
Das Kapital, Volume 1. He said the labor time required to produce any use value under the conditions of production normal for a given society and with the average degree of skill and intensity of labor, labor prevalent in that society. So he said, okay, this is how where socially necessary labor is defined, that it's the time that human labor is, that's being contributed into it. It has to do with the use value that's produced from it. So the time to bake a loaf of bread and the labor that goes into it. Now there are some limits and some constraints. It's under the conditions of production normal for a given society. So not all societies would necessarily be the same. In some societies, they may have more advanced technology like ovens and different things to bake a loaf of bread and some may not. But within a certain society, what is the average amount of labor time it takes to bake a loaf of bread? Then you also take the average degree of skills. Some bakers are better than others. Some bakers are worse than others. So you kind of average it out. What is the average amount of skill, the average amount of time, the average amount of labor to produce a use value or socially necessary labor time prevalent in that society? So he basically argued that it is average labor time plus the use value created, meaning the, the value that it creates for someone else, like shoes someone else can wear, uh, is where the value comes from, averaging all these things out in a given society. So he says, okay, so this is the definition that you have to have the human labor plus usefulness to others, use value, is where the value comes from. Now, Marx wants to isolate what it is in commodities that gives them their value. So he came up with a methodology. And his methodology might arguably be valid because of the way he came up with it. It could empirically demonstrate what Marx wants it to demonstrate. How could this, his idea of value, that value is defined by the labor theory that values is defined by human labor involved in production of goods and services. Well, how would you prove it or disprove it? Previous economists didn't attempt to prove it or disprove it. They just assumed it. Marx went a little bit further and he brings up this methodology that could be valid. Now, Marx did not follow his own methodology consistently as I'll demonstrate. But he believed, and this is kind of an interesting idea, he thought that if finding a common denominator between all different kinds of commodities, goods and services, would allow you to determine where value comes from. In other words, how do you figure out where value comes from when goods are all so different? When you've got the cell phone, the shirt, the loaf of bread, the haircut, the person digging the ditch, how do you figure out between all those commodities, which is another way of saying goods and services, how do you isolate and figure out where value comes from? What is it that makes something valuable and how it contributes to how much value that it has? And so Marx basically came up with this idea that if you can narrow it down to the one thing that all of these goods and services share in common, that is the one thing that gives it its value. And that's actually a pretty good methodology if you think about it, because it, it takes away the aspect of where shoes and cell phones and haircuts and ditch digging is all different. And it shows what's the one thing that they all share. So this is kind of, he didn't draw this, but this is kind of, my version of it, of how did he think through this? So he said, look, you take all these different commodities, you kind of do a Venn diagram, you see, okay, they're, here's their differences. Here's what this one has that this one does not have. But what do they all share in common? And obviously there'd be more than two. There would be hundreds, you know, thousands, millions of different commodities. But here's how they all are different from one another. 
what is the common variable? And his reasoning is that if you find what is common to all commodities, you find what makes it valuable. And that's a pretty interesting idea. And his methodology may be valid as far as it goes. So he comes up with this human labor and utility value. So remember our definition of what he defined socially necessary labor as at the beginning. We're going to see that there's two problems with this theory of Marx's methodology, uh, of Marx's theory and how he applies his methodology. One, and probably the biggest one, is it is logically self-defeating. Marx engages in question begging or circular reasoning, meaning he assumes what he seeks to prove. And he, by the labor theory of value's own standard, Marx shows why the labor theory of value is false, even though he's trying to show that it's proved. Uh, that, that it's true. And second of all, it's contrary to experiential reality, meaning what he claims to be the case, he actually shows that it is not true. So the labor theory of value is proven to be untrue by its own standard, which is to say that it's logically self-defeating. And so another way to say it is with these two sentences, that if Marx's methodology is true, then his conclusion is wrong, as we'll see. And if Marx's conclusion is true, then his methodology is wrong. The methodology that he tries to use to prove his conclusion is wrong. So either way, the labor theory of value cannot be true based on its own standard of claims. So let's look at the logical inconsistencies here, the, the internal contradiction of what Marx is saying. Now, he asks the question, what do different commodities, different goods and services all have in common? Now, he asked a good question, and he actually had arguably a good methodology to find it. Now, we see that a commodity has to include, for Marx, human labor, plus use value, which is, it must be, uh, that it must be useful or necessary in some way to others in society. So by definition, labor must have those two things, those two things. It uh, value has to come from, according to the definition, human labor plus that human labor must be useful to others in society. Okay. Now, what Marx sees by his own methodology is that not just one, but both of these factors are in commodities. So he was trying to isolate for one single common denominator between all commodities, goods and services, but he actually kind of comes up with two, human labor and use value, meaning he comes up with basically the idea that if you see what all these different goods and services have in common, they actually have in common a couple of things. One, according to Marx, that in the theory is that they had to be products of human labor. And two, they had to be useful to others. So, But Marx says, in using this methodology, we're going to ignore one of those factors and focus on the other. We're going to ignore use value and focus on labor. So this is what he did. Is He came to this conclusion of, okay, all these commodities seem to have, according to the theory, human labor and use value. 
in them. But then listen to what he says in his own words. He says, if we disregard the use value of commodities, only one property remains, that of being products of labor. But what is his basis for disregarding what he says is part of his original definition? Utility value or use value was used to define valuable human labor in the definition but then is arbitrarily abandoned by Marx in the conclusion. So in other words, Marx said, in order for something to be labor, to be considered valuable labor, it has to have human effort, human labor time put into it, number one. And number two, it has to be useful to other humans in society. But then, he says, okay, if you look at all commodities, goods and services, what do they all share in common? Well, they share in common two things, but he says, we're going to ignore one of the things and just focus on the other. But he shows in doing this that the logical inconsistency and his own methodology proves his theory to be false. This is what Marx wanted to attempt to do. He shows Okay, here are the things that they have in common, which should point to where items get their value, but he basically wants us to ignore one and focus on the other. And lo and behold, he wants us to focus on what he was already assuming from the beginning. So he assumed what he sought to prove, which is question begging, circular reasoning, or a self-defeating argument. So he basically used uh, use value to define his terms. And then once it showed up in his conclusion, he threw it, he threw it away in order to draw the conclusion that he wanted. Again, if we disregard use value of commodities, well, who says you can do that? How can you throw it away when it's part of the definition? If we disregard use value of commodities, only one property remains, that of being products of labor. So use value is used to, uh, to establish the definition of value or labor in the premise, but then is rejected in the conclusion. So that's why I said, if Marx's methodology is true, his conclusion is wrong because his conclusion does not match the results of his methodology. But if Marx's conclusion is right, then his methodology that he used is wrong. So either way, Marx has on his hands a self-defeating argument, and therefore the labor theory of value is entirely self-defeating on the basis, not of external critique, but on the basis of its own terms, it cannot stand up. And so basically, Marx followed this method. He used the definition, average labor time plus use value equals valuable human labor. But then his, in his conclusion, he sees average labor time crosses out use value and then says average labor time and human labor is the only thing that contributes to value. Now, it's not only logically inconsistent, but Marx's claim does not match experiential reality. His assertion is that all commodities have in common human labor, but that is untrue. Not all things that are valuable are valuable because of human labor. And you could think of several examples that people uh, could stumble upon in nature that are untouched by human labor or that have been touched by human labor but are not valued because of the human lab labor involved in them. Like a farmer finding land or wood in trees or oil in the ground or stumbling across water, fresh water when you're thirsty. That these are not things that are valuable because of the human labor that has been expended on them. They are valuable independent of human labor. 
And so not all commodities are valuable because of human labor. Now, Marx himself, within the space of a couple of pages, acknowledges this to be true. And he has to make this kind of strange distinction. In this first sentence, he says, a thing can be a use value. That is, <laughs> remember, use value means it's useful to other people and therefore they value it. He goes, a thing can be a use value without being a value. Meaning, <laughs> by his own definitions, he realizes he's run into a problem here because there are plenty of things that can be useful to people and bring utility and be valuable to people that don't have a value, according to him, because they don't have any human labor. So he says this is the case whenever its utility to man is not mediated through labor. Meaning there are plenty of things that we value whether or not humans have expended any labor on them or not. He gives a few examples. Air, virgin soil, natural meadows, unplanted forests, etc. fall into this category. So one thing that I've said is the very air that we breathe, which is not a product of human labor, the very air that we breathe shows the labor theory of value to be false because the air is valuable to us, not because uh, of human labor, but because we need it for other purposes. We need air to survive. And air is not a product of human labor. Therefore, if you look at what all commodities have in common, according to Marx, the idea was that they had actually two things in common, use value and human labor. He crosses out use value and says, focus on human labor. But actually, we see that that first idea was logically inconsistent to get rid of use value. And now we see that the second part is does not match with experiential reality because not all products are valuable because of the human labor involved in them. So the conclusion is actually the opposite, that what all commodities, according to Marx's methodology, if followed consistently, hold in common is not human labor. But instead, what all commodities hold in common is their use value or social utility. But so that they must be useful to human beings. Human beings see some value in them and some need in them. But I think if Marx followed this consistently, he'd end up at the conclusion of what is called economically, and which is discovered around the time of Marx and, and elaborated on over the next few decades after Marx's death, is the idea of subjective value, that different people can be looking at the same commodity, and one may value it very highly and another may value it kind of, you know, not as highly and somebody else may not value it at all. And there are different valuations of the same commodity are based on their subjective value preferences, not based on the input costs into the item or the labor that was involved in it. In other words, human beings, the consumers, subjectively value things. So Marx's methodology actually would have led to that conclusion and should have led him to reject the labor theory of value. But instead, Marx took on a position of assuming what he wanted to prove and argued instead for the labor theory of value, even though it was logically inconsistent and against experiential reality. So his methodology, in a sense, actually proves that the opposite of his theory is true.